I'm Akosh, uh, the CEO of Airtime, which is an autonomous product discovery platform that turns customer calls into product insights. And today we have the third module of Airtime Academy hosted by uh, Dr. Brian Rill. And this module is gonna focus on validating solutions. In the previous mon modules, in the first one, we looked at <clears throat> how to understand your customer. And then the second one, how to focus on the most important problem. And I think without further ado, you're not here today to listen to me, but to listen to Brian, who has a lot of wisdom and a lot of amazing stories. So let me hand over the mic to you, Brian. All right, thank you and very kick much. It, kick it, let's kick it off. All right, well, welcome back everyone uh, to the third part. If you've been to the first two, you know we cover a lot of ground in these sessions. Um, and then of course, you know, we're available to communicate with you afterwards to follow up with any questions you have. So please feel free to reach out. We can schedule a call and continue the conversation or just post your questions in Slack and one of us will get to them eventually. <laughs> um, we'll get there. Um, but today we have a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, and let me see, um, I'm trying to play around with my screen layout. So if I have a little bit of a technical thing for a second, Excuse me, I'm just trying to make sure I can see all the slides and you at the same time. Okay, so where are we? Well, we are talking today about validating solutions. And let me see, again, I've got to kind of figure out my controls here. Okay, so at this point, hopefully you guys have understood a problem that you're solving, you validated your solution concept, you've come up with a series of different ideas, right? Maybe you prototype these, maybe those are just still concepts in your head and it's time to figure out which one's best. Now I'll stop here because this is often a step that I see a lot of companies skip. Um, it's kind of like once they do their discovery and they make the business case for something, they just charge forward and they build it and then they release it and they find out in beta if it was good or not. Um, and you're gonna see in a few slides that while that's a speedy approach, it's also a very risky one. This is weird, I have to use controls in two different places. So when we are looking at the you know double diamond model, right? We've been, we've been referencing this throughout the modules. We're finally at the end of this, right? This is the last stage when you've really done all your exploration and now you're testing to find out, you know, does this thing that I've built work, right? Is it gonna land right? Is it gonna have a good user experience? Whoops. So the, um, Today, you know, we're basically going to talk about four things. Why do we test solutions? What are your options for testing? We're going to cover some fundamentals with usability testing. And then we're going to talk a little bit about reporting for impact. So why do we do this in the first place? Well, prototyping is the stage in design where you're creating sketches and inexpensive models of the concept, right? If you have users with uh, to interact with and they can give feedback on these early concepts, you're going to learn a lot. Right. And in my personal experience, 100% of the time, users point out something that you hadn't thought of. Right. And why? Well, it's pretty simple, really. It's because we're all biased by our own experiences and our vision. And this creates confirmation bias, which is the tendency to see what confirms our ideas and ignore the things that don't confirm them. And more often than that, or moreover, I should say, nobody really wants to admit that their baby is ugly. <laughs> okay. So this leads me to a few uh, prototyping principles that I want to go over. Um, and I want to start by talking about this thing called um, functional fixation, which is a psychological effect that was first studied by Carl Dunker back in the 1940s. Um, what he found was that independent of testing condition, participants tended to pick one idea and stick with it. Now, he imposed all kinds of constraints and time obviously gave people less exploration. And that's something as product managers, you're all very well aware of, right? You never have enough time to do the research that you wanna do. Um, but even when people were given more time in these studies, it didn't change anything. And when they interviewed them afterwards, people said, oh yeah, I had fully explored the concepts and they couldn't even see other alternatives um, for what they were doing. And this is something that goes on in our psychology. So how do we get past this, right? Well, the answer is, is three things. One, you keep it simple in the beginning, right? You ramp up fidelity over time, starting with just sketches or very low fidelity prototypes, only really using the detail that you need just to get that initial feedback. And don't get attached to things, right? Just as important is that you have more than one thing that you're testing, right? If you just test one solution, you're in a, in a go or a no-go situation. 
right? But if you have two or three different prototypes or two or three different versions of the same solution, then you can test these and figure out which one works best, right? So it's really important to create these alternatives and really slow down for a bit, right? And observe intently how people are interacting with them to understand which one's the best one. And then finally, based upon those results, you iterate your idea and you work to perfect not only the product, but how you communicate that product to people. Okay, so this is that cost diagram I was referencing a second ago. Uh, Human-centered design as an overall process, you know, is great for helping understand people and develop empathy um, and really build things that meet people's needs, but it has a pretty strong business case too. And here it is, right? If you prototype and you fail and you learn early, the cost is very low, you know, the longer you wait, the greater the risk increases. And if you wait until launch to find out, um, your cost can be at minimum 10 times higher and up to 100 times more to fix a problem after it's gone into production than during the prototyping stage. Whereas if you test prototypes before you start sending them to development, then you have the opportunity to catch those mistakes earlier. And that leads to better adoption and better CSAT, which at the end of the day equals better revenue for your company. So that leads us to our first exercise. And this is just kind of a self-assessment, right? Um, that I want you to jot down a couple notes. And I'm going to show you how to build a business case to do this type of validation work. So first you think about the last time you developed something without testing it, right? And ask yourself what happened, right? When that was released, how many customer complaints did you have? How many uh, feedback requests did you get where you had to make small changes? What reworks did you have to do, right? And try to think of that in times of, well, how many people got involved in this process and about how many hours do you think it took, right, um, for them to make these changes? And then think about a different time where you did test something fully before you released it. And what's the difference between those two experiences for you? And not only in terms of just like the practical outcomes, like, you know, time and cost saved, but like, how did the team feel? right? Were you motivated? Were you excited? Were you happy with what you launched? Or did you launch it and go, I'm not quite sure if this is going to work. And you were just kind of expecting some things to go wrong and have to fix them. Because honestly, that really affects your motivation as a team moving forward. Now, all you got to do is take the number of hours that were worked by the development team, designers, product managers, and customer success, fixing whatever errors were made. Um, and then multiply that by $100 an hour. And guess what? there's your business case. Now, let's just say it was a small thing, right? Maybe it was a few hours of customer success. Um, maybe it was a few hours of design and maybe, you know, a dozen hours of development. So 20 hours, okay? That's still 20 times 100. What is that? $2,000, right? Could you have done a short test for the equivalent of $2,000? Sure, you could have, all right? And that's a really, really small use case. Usually the numbers are much, much larger than that. So how do you test? What options do you have as product managers? Well, I'm going to talk about four today. Um, Akush, could I ask a favor of you? I have a hard time advancing both my keynote and the slides at the same time. So if I just say next slide, can you advance the PDF that everybody's looking at? Happy to do that. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's, you can tell I have a time lag here. Um, so we're going to talk about interviews, A-B testing, and then two different versions of usability testing, moderated and unmoderated. Okay, next slide. When we look at these things in the product development cycle, right, um, you can see here that validating one or more solutions occurs primarily in the design stage of product development. When this is not feasible or it gets deprioritized, this testing tends to shift to the deliver stage. And this is where the rework cost starts to go up significantly. Um, but it's still one last chance to check things before a big public release. And so I often get asked the question, you know, when do we do what type of tests? And so here's my short answer, right? If you have low fidelity designs to help pick the best solution, you test those as early as possible, definitely in the design stage, okay? Um, when you get to high fidelity designs, um, test usability before sending it to dev. If you can't do usability testing for some reason, that's where design validation interviews come in, okay? You use A-B testing um, when you're trying to design between or decide between two alternatives. So that's back in the design stage. And finally, you do beta testing. And this is when you've already built something um, and maybe you haven't done the testing beforehand, but you want to test it um, before the big public release. Okay. And different organizations have different capacities and work in different paces. So these are all options. My big thing to prioritize is that 
make sure you do test it. And the earlier is better. Next slide. So um, I want to talk about some things that I've learned about ownership of these processes in product teams. Um, Because I'm a big fan of Marty Kagan's book, um, Inspired and the Triad Model. Um, But I will say that it has some consequences that sometimes get overlooked. Um, And one of them is this idea that, oh, well, great. We have a product manager, a designer, and someone from the engineering team making decisions collaboratively together so that you don't have silos. That's awesome. But it doesn't include the researcher in that picture. And that's a mistake. So what ends up happening is the product manager becomes responsible for research. Um, And I've worked in organizations where, um, you know, there's this beautiful idea of democratizing research, right? Let's have everybody do a little bit of research, right? Um, And it is a beautiful ideal and it is possible, but it is a big commitment, right? And it's a big culture change commitment, right? So if you want to train your product team how to do good research, you have to invest as an organization into that enablement process. And that can take months, that can take years. So I just want to be honest with you. I've seen it succeed. I've seen it fail more often than not. Um, I think it's very important to know thyself, right? And really do a strong self-assessment about not only the capacity of your product managers and previous training with research or your designers as well, but do they even have the bandwidth to do it? Right. You can't just say, oh, here's your full time job. And on top of that, I'd like you to learn how to do usability testing. Um, It's not going to work. Okay, and if it does work, you're going to end up with designers and product managers attempting to do research because they've been told to not doing a very good job of it or struggling with the tools. And then they just don't want to do it because they they think the process is not worth it or the tool is too hard to use. And so they stop doing it. And all of a sudden you're skipping those stages again. So be aware and be honest and then fill the gap appropriately. Finally, I think it's important to think about how we use AI because it's all the rage, right? I was just reading an article about it this morning um, from the Nielsen Norman Group. And, um, you know, the the bottom line is that, you know, AI is not going to replace designers, managers, or researchers. It's going to be our partners as we move forward into the future. So don't think that you can just use an AI tool in place of a researcher um, because to use an AI tool for research, you have to know how it works for research. And that means you have to have someone that's really invested time into understanding the pros and cons and where it can and can't be used. So again, it kind of comes back to, you need to have someone with that expertise on your team in order to leverage that new asset that we have. Next slide, please. So at the end of the day, this is one of my favorite sayings, especially to product teams. Um, And this was a quote that Napoleon said to his army as they were marching across Europe. He said, slow down, I'm in a hurry. And the point of this was he knew that he might be able to get to his destination faster if he drove his troops. But when he got there, the troops would be in terrible shape and they'd probably lose the battle. So he slowed down so that his army was in better condition. I think that's a pretty valuable lesson for most product teams I know. Okay, next slide. So at the when it comes down to it, what I've seen is that there is fundamentally two pathways that organizations take when it comes to um, validating solutions. Path one. is usually for teams that don't have a dedicated researcher. Okay, so they'll do design validation interviews and they'll do A-B testing to collect what's called attitudinal data, how people think or feel about a product or service. um, And they present them to these through interviews or unmoderated surveys. Path two um, is usually done with teams that either have a researcher or who outsource this effort to an agency. Um, And you can see that this involves usability testing that captures both the attitudinal data and also behavioral data, which is observing how people actually interact with the product or service. And the bottom line is here, it's behavioral data that tells us what we really want to know about usability issues, right? There's what people say and what people do are two different things. And we have to watch people in order to understand usability issues. But this takes more effort and skill. It delivers better results but it's more effort and skill. So a choice has to be made between these two pathways. So let's talk about the techniques in these. Design validation or design review are terms that I've often heard used um, where people present a prototype and they wanna get feedback on it. Um, And these are best done as moderated interviews. If you go to the next slide, please. And the goal here is simply just to have a conversation with people um, and to present them something and usually, you know, ask some questions that maybe you're not sure about certain directions that you're going in the product or you've designed things and you're like, hmm, 
you know, does this thing go here or here? I want to know what people prefer and why, right? And so you need to have a, com a human conversation with people for that. So this is a very common technique. And this is one that product managers and designers are usually very good at. I have a lot of confidence in the ability here of the teams that I work with. Um, next slide. So um, how do we do this? Well, the first thing is you want to set the stage. So you give them what we call a UX scenario, um, which is a kind of a, a lived reality contextual script, right? That allows them to kind of step into the role of the user and the experience that you're showing them, right? Um, and then once you have kind of set that context, you show them the prototype, and it really depends here on what you've prepared. Um, pretty common formats that I work with are either walkthroughs of high fidelity prototypes in Figma, um, or if it's actually in the sandbox environment, that's great too. Um, or um, someone might record a Loom video of them stepping through their own prototype and they kind of narrate um, what that experience is like. So the user is not directly interacting with the prototype in most of these interviews. They're being shown something and then having a conversation around it. Now, it's great if you do have a prototype that someone can interact with and you can share the link with them and you can say, hey, click through this and let's have a conversation. But that takes a bit more time for the designers to prepare that asset. The type of questions that I like to ask in these um, interviews um, are per scenario and then follow up. So uh, it's important to think about what a scenario is. A scenario is a particular flow. Right, so every flow that you want to show to a user has its own scenario. And so you start off with setting the scene for that scenario, you allow them to explore it, and then you ask these questions, right? I always start with very high level questions, like what's your overall impression of this, right? Or what do you think this is and what does it do for you, okay? Um, and then once I get those impressions, I will ask them to kind of walk through how they might use that experience or review a page and say, you know, what stands out to you? What makes sense? What doesn't? Um, and then from those high level questions, I'll usually probe into things that are of particular interest to me. So how often do you usually do something like this? What's your normal process? What do you need in order to succeed, et cetera? And I do that for each scenario. And then at the end of the scenarios, um, then we kind of have these overall questions, right? This whole thing that we've shown you, again, high level, what's your overall impression? What are your concerns or questions that you have? What worked, what didn't? Um, and again, a bunch more kind of specific questions. And the ones I have here in the slide are questions that I find work pretty well for every product I've ever worked with. But I would say that in each of these interviews, there's also some very specific questions that product managers or designers want to know answers to. So they add that to this bank of questions. And also don't try asking all of these. This is way too many questions for an interview. Um, you're gonna ask maybe four or five of these, right? So pick which things are most important for you to learn. Um, and the way I design interview guides is I, I have the core questions that I must have answered. And then I have a bunch of other stuff that I'm interested in. And I look at the amount of time I'm on the call and I go, okay, if this person has a hard stop in a half hour, I'm going to get through my core questions and I might, if I'm lucky, have time to ask one or two others. Um, if I'm on an hour call with them or they don't mind going longer than the scheduled call, we can get into a deeper conversation. So I'm kind of triaging my own questions. So around what's critical and what's nice to have. Um, these interviews are also fantastic ways to build your research panel. So anytime I have a conversation with a customer at all, if I think that they might be someone that will give me good feedback on the product, I always invite them to the panel, right? And say, hey, can we contact you again in the future to talk about the product? And if you get all of your team in this practice, you can actually build a panel fairly quickly. Okay, next slide. Another big testing technique is A-B testing. And I'm not gonna go into the nuts and bolts of this because um, there's a lot of great platforms that are really good at constructing the experiment for you. So I don't need to tell you how to design the experiment. All I need to do is tell you the principles of it. You know, this is when you're testing um, variations of the same idea. Um, and there's AB, there's ABN, and there's multivariate testing. So there's different levels of AB testing depending on the number of variables that you wanna compare. It's very important to do two things when you do AB testing. One is um, create the minimal amount of change possible to test. Because if you change five things, and then you're looking at like a, a change in conversion rate or something, there's no way of knowing which of those five things actually led to the change in conversion. Right. So you want to change one, maybe two things at a time. So it's very easy to identify causally and statistically 
which one actually led to the improvement or change in some way or another of the product. Okay. If you want to have two completely different designs um, and you want to see which one performs better and there's a whole bunch of variations, don't do A-B testing. Do moderated interviews with people and have a conversation around the two different versions and see which one they like and why. But if you want to get statistical significance and you want to get hard crunching on the numbers, then you test one little piece at a time and also test over time. Because you don't know if like Thanksgiving season is going to influence the way people interact with your product or Christmas or Easter or any other holiday or something happened in their life, right? So the only way to actually get statistically significant results is to test over three to six months, right? That way you are ruling out like short momentary things that could really affect product usage. So A-B testing, there's, in my mind, there's really two fundamentally different types. There's the quick A-B testing when you have a couple prototypes and you're trying to decide what you want to go forward with. And, and a lot of times it's good to do conversations with people or maybe an unmoderated survey where you're just collecting some basic attitudinal impressions, right? Um, and then there is the much more rigorous, statistically significant A-B testing when you have a product and you're saying, I'm going to change one thing in this product and see if it makes a difference in one metric that matters to my organization. And that's the longer form A-B testing. And there's a bunch of good platforms out there for both of these. Next slide, please. So these are, nope, I'm sorry, previous slide. <laughs> A-B testing and, and design validation interviews are fantastic techniques, but they are attitudinal studies right? They're quick, they're relatively inexpensive, um, but they're not actually a great indicator of human behavior. They're a good indicator of human attitudes. And again, what people say and what people do are different. Okay, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about humans. <laughs> um, and this comes from lots and lots of studies in psychology and cognitive science. Um, when it, people are asked for an opinion, most of the time they'll form one right on the spot. And these opinions aren't very deeply held. And this is one of the big weaknesses of things like focus groups. If you hold a focus group with people and you start a conversation and one person says something and another person in the group may not have a strongly formed opinion, most likely they're going to either align or oppose the thing that was said right before them. And, and that is instantly made. And you have the problem of groupthink where if like multiple people, let's say you have a focus group of 10 people and like four or five of them start jiving off of each other and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden, everybody's going to go along with that. You might have one dissenter, but again, that's not a real reflection of what people think. Um, so we have to be aware of that. Um, also, um, often when people do understand the real reason why they do things, they may not want to tell you because they might be slightly embarrassed by that, right? Like, I eat healthy. I eat salads all the time. I'm probably not going to tell you I put three ounces of ranch dressing on my salad, which kind of ruins the whole health MO thing. If you guys question me, just look up the ingredients of ranch dressing. You'll never eat it again. Or maybe you're going to love it more. I'm not sure. Right? <laughs> it's just personal. But the point is, is that we're not going to say that. Right. Um, and then often when people do tell you things, they only tell you partial truths. Right. Or no truth. You never really get the whole truth. Um, and there's lots of reasons for this, but part of it is, you know, maybe they're being paid and they think that, oh, you know, my job here is, is to uh, give supportive information, right? Or worse, they're your friend or someone that knows you. And the last thing they want to do is, is ruin your day, right? So um, they, they just don't tell the truth all the time when they know. And more importantly, next slide, please. Many times people don't understand why they're doing things. Okay, this is a great book that I recommend everybody reading, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And uh, what Common points out in this book is that most of our behavior is unconscious, okay? Um, and he shows tests in this book where people even believe their own answer, okay? And when they do get tested, they don't even notice the dissonance between something they just did and their explanation of it. OK, so you can literally ask someone to do something and they'll do it. And then you ask them to explain it and they give you a different explanation. And you're like, and a really great example of this is like online shopping experiences. Right. When you ask people, why did they make a purchase decision? Right. And they'll tell you, oh, I made a purchase decision based upon X or Y criteria. But then you look at the way they actually did their shopping and they just like look for the brand they like. Right. Um, and it's like, wait a minute. 
you said that you shopped based upon value, but you went straight to Adidas or Nordstrom Rack. Um, I'm not sure that's the best value for your money. So again, there's that dissonance and people don't recognize that. Okay. And the reason why is because it's not that people are intentionally lying to us. It's because our brains try to weave coherent stories for ourselves. And then when asked, our brain instantly puts together a story to tell you. Okay. Um, that makes us very efficient, but also pretty inaccurate. Next slide. So what's the solution? Okay. Well, it's called usability testing. And um, this is a very robust method for understanding how well your product will succeed or fail. And one of my favorite pictures is on this slide, and it's the kitten eating the camera. Um, we build things, and many, many times we do not anticipate other factors that could influence us. And if any of you have ever had a cat and a camera, this might have happened to you, right? Kittens chew on things, right? When they're teething, they find things that are very appealing to them, and somehow the body of a camera is just fantastic, right? Was your camera built tough enough to survive your kitten? Did you think about that in your product testing? Okay. Um, when you put things in real people's hands in the real world, in real environments or simulated real environments, then you find out a lot more than if you just have conversations. This is a quote um, from Steve Jobs that I like to, to reference. Um, and it's the point in my mind of, of good usability testing or when you're trying to evaluate if your feature set is the right feature set. And if you're trying to build everything that's possible, that's great. Um, you're going to spend a lot of money building a lot of stuff that only a certain amount of it is going to be used, right? The goal is to say no to as much as possible so that you're saying yes to what's really important. Next slide, please. So I've been using this term. What's usability? Let me define it for you. Um, Basically, it's a term used to denote the ease of which people can employ a particular tool, right? This is the Wikipedia definition. And if we go to the next slide, this is the um, ISO definition. So this is the golden standard of usability, right? Um, it is a measure of effectiveness, right? How well can com people complete their tasks? And so we can measure this by observing something called task success. Could they do it on their own with no assistance? Great. That's a pass. Could they do it, but they had to do some kind of a workaround and it wasn't a happy, it wasn't the happy path? That's a pass with a little bit of difficulty. Or could they not do it and they needed some help from you? Or did they have to access a help manual? That's a fail. Okay. Um, so we can create objective measures of task success and we call this effectiveness. Efficiency is the time. So the way we measure this is time on task. How quickly or how long did it take for someone to actually complete the tasks they're trying to do? So you've probably heard the standard of the less clicks, the better, right? That um, is, is a statement that is speaking to efficiency, right? If I can do something in two clicks instead of five clicks, that means it's a more efficient user experience design. Is it always better to have less clicks? No, but you want to go for the most efficient experience possible. Right, so maybe it's a balance between the amount of interactions a user has to take and the amount of support you give those interactions until they learn the mental model of your product, right? Um, that's a longer conversation than we have time for today, but this is one of those things that we measure with usability. And then finally, satisfaction. Do people like it, right? Do they enjoy using your product or service? And, and we live in a world today where um, people have choices with pretty much any product they want. Long gone are the days where if you wanted something, you had to go through one company that had absolute rights to it and it was just locked down. You know, now if I want any piece of software or any tool, I've got dozens of options usually to choose from. So which one am I going to choose? Well, most likely, I'm going to choose the one that's the most effective, the most efficient, and the most satisfying to me. And so for all you UX designers in the audience, this is for you, right? This is why UX design matters, right? Because that's the goal of good UX design is to make these as positive as possible for people so that your product is chosen over the competition. And this is what we're measuring with usability tests. So usability testing, first of all, involves real people. If any of you are using synthetic users, please get in touch with me after this workshop and I'm going to give you about a gazillion reasons why that's a bad idea. <laughs> okay, don't do it. It's terrible. It involves real tasks, right? You're not just making up scenarios and asking people what they think about it. You're not asking people, hey, do you like this idea? No, you're saying, 
please try to accomplish this goal of yours using our product or service. And then you're going to sit back and you're going to watch them succeed or fail. And this is the hardest part about usability testing is not helping people, right? Like <laughs> every one of us, we're like, we watch someone struggle to find that button in our interface, right? And, and they, you watch their mouse like move all over the screen and their eyes go everywhere and the heat maps are all messed up if you're using those. And you're like, it's right in front of you, but you can't say that, right? You have to wait until they ask you for help, right? And then you go, oh yeah, it's in the top right corner. And they go, oh, I never thought about that. And you go, why didn't you think about that? And they go, well, I was expecting it to be in the top left. Aha, lesson learned, right? So watching what they're doing and then having conversations with them about what they're doing and why they're doing it, that's the key, right? And this is a very systematic, rigorous method, right? You don't do usability testing from coming to this workshop and thinking, I'm going to go do it afterwards. You learn how to do usability testing by going through thorough training and then practicing until you get good at it. Um, so here's some of the things that you need to learn how to do to do this correctly. Um, one, you have to learn how to design and plan your test correctly. Um, two, you have to re recruit the right people for the tests. Um, three, you need things like checklists to make sure that your test runs without a hitch. And this is one of the assets I'm gonna put in the resource folder um, right after this workshop is what a usability testing checklist looks like, both in terms of preparing for one and in terms of running one. You need to write really good test tasks that are relevant both to you as a business and to your customers. Um, then you have to go through the logistics of organizing, preparing the testing sections. And then you have to get good at moderating, helping people transition from thinking just inside their head to actually sharing what's inside their head with you. And there's a series of prompts that you can learn to help with that as well. Next slide, please. So I do want to just repeat my cautionary note here. This is not a skill that you learn in a day or in a weekend, okay? It is worth every dime to pay someone who has this skill set or in your own internal company to invest in the cost of training your team to be good at this. Okay, you have to do a bandwidth check as well. Understand that a single usability test takes a minimum of 20 to 30 hours to do. And that involves planning, recruitment, follow-up, execution, analysis, and sharing. All right, this is uh, actually a minimal estimate. In my experience, it takes 30 to 40 hours to run a good usability test. So do you have the time for that? Right? If you as a product team don't have the time for that, pay someone else who does. If you don't have the skill for that, pay someone else who does, right? You'll get that return on investment, I guarantee you. So exercise number two, this is your second organizational self-assessment of the day. So from what I just shared with you, on a scale of one to five, how prepared are you to execute, right? A five is I'm totally prepared, we've got this. A one is mm, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. A three is, okay, we're decent at this, but we have room to improve. So just give yourself a rating there for a second. Um, and then ask yourself the next question, which is how much are you willing or how much do you think your organization should be willing to invest in um, internal training? And finally, do you have the time for this, right? Be honest. Do you actually have the time to spend at least a couple months learning the technique and practicing it before you start doing it for real? And then do you have 20, 30, 40 hours per study to actually execute these properly? So I'd love, this is one of those great opportunities where I'd love to see uh, how people respond. If you wanna copy and paste your answers into the chat, let's just see where everybody's at. I'm gonna take a look over here at the comments, see what people are saying. We also got a question, by the way, uh, until people start posting their answers to this about, allocating resources uh, for testing and design stage in early stage companies. I think it's essential, you know, especially in early stage companies, you don't know a lot of things. So how are you going to make, how are you going to gain certainty? Do you, do you want to take the risk of losing your entire first set of users by putting out a product that you're not sure if it really works well or solves their problem? Um, you can do that. And then you could, you know, release it publicly um, watch it fall on its face and then learn a bunch from that, go back, redesign your product and then launch it more successfully. And believe me, I've seen this happen. I work with clients that do this. Okay. Not what I recommend. My recommendation is, you know, 
and I know there's this huge pressure, especially with startups to get to market as soon as possible, but do you want to get there and fail or do you want to get there and succeed is the question I ask. I really think it's important to dedicate these resources. Um, most often though, you can't afford a full-time researcher at this stage. So this is where contracting out these services is really useful. There's so much going on with early stage and startups that most companies don't have the bandwidth for this. Just hire someone that's good at it, right? Um, at a project-based level, you know, you get your product to a certain point, you hire them to come in and uh, execute the evaluative testing for you. You get the results, you know, then you don't have to pay that research team for a while again, because now you have information that you can act upon. You go back, you make those changes, you bring them back on to test it a second time, you know, and, and you repeat this however many times you need. And then once you get the green light, once your tests are coming back good, then it's like, okay, let's go. Let's launch it. Right. So that is a more incremental approach to involving this where you're just hiring outside resources at a project based level. And that's very, I think, cost efficient for that stage of companies. But it's that's not just startup companies and that's not early stage. Big companies can do the same thing. Right. Um, it's fantastic and recommended to have a professional researcher on your team. But if you just can't do that, you can contract out. It'll probably cost you less overall as a company throughout a year to do that. Um, than to have a full-time researcher, but that's just a matter of what kind of culture do you want? If you want that researcher to be part of your team and part of everyday decisions and really have a finger on the pulse of everything that's going on, hire them internally, even at least part-time. If you don't need that and you just need things executed for, for feedback, then contract them. Okay, let me take a look at some of these results. Okay, uh, <laughs> a one out of five, um, willing to allocate time for training, but not sure where to start. <laughs> Thanks for thanks for the kudos for the webinars. Thank you. Um, I don't think PMs have the time, but it depends on company maturity. Well, Marie, let's have a conversation afterwards. We can figure that out. Um, uh, it's a three for me. Akosh, is that you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I, no, it's it's no cheating. It's just while you were answering the question, I also thought it for for ourselves, and I didn't give top marks for myself. I, I would try to be as honest as possible. I appreciate the the the. Yeah, I know. Here, but you know, right? you know, with the name Akash, I can't really hide in the crowd. Right? No, I was like, wait a minute. There's not a, there's a lot of Akashes in the audience. <laughs> I think you do a little bit better than this. I'll, I'll give you at least a four, my friend. Um, but uh, there's always room for improvement, right? We never get this perfectly. We, there's always, uh, we always wish we could do more evaluation than we can. And that's just the nature of the game, right? Because we're balancing um, different priorities, right? And so we just got to make sure we, we do it at some level. All right, let's carry on. Let's move on to the next slide here. Okay, so let's say that you still want to try, right? You're not going to heed my morning <laughs> warnings and you're saying, let's do this. So I'm going to give you some tips that will help you succeed, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to cover the basics of a remote moderated usability test. That means that you are having conversations with people, but you're doing it like this through Zoom and you're doing screen sharing. Um, and this is by far the most common format today. And the good news is while it's not cheap, it's way less expensive than traditional usability labs. Um, we don't really have time to cover unmoderated usability testing today, but the principles I'm gonna teach you apply in both settings. So the first thing you do, next slide please, is you create a usability test plan. And this is another one of the resources I'm gonna put in the folder, um, where you essentially are designing out all the pieces that you need to be successful, right? This is really great also for internally selling the value of usability testing because it maps out to the key stakeholders what's going to happen when and what's what's going to be done with that information and why we're doing it why does it matter to the business okay the other thing is it makes sure that there's consistency so that multiple people in the organization can execute on the same plan um, often you just have one person doing a usability test but if you start to create assets like this and you have like one really, really good test that goes well and you capture all of that in documentation, then that then can be used to train other people in your organization what a good execution looks like, right? So a lot of companies I work with where we do try to go for democratization, one of the things we'll do is my team will conduct a usability test from start to finish in partnership with their team, you know? Um, and we'll do the whole thing together and we'll do it at the level and the standard that that I personally um, insist on, and that's very high, right? 
Um, but then we save all that information, including the coaching and the mentoring sessions. And then internally, someone becomes a champion of that method, and they then pass on that knowledge to other members of the team. And that is a cost efficient way of leveling up your team is you work with an outsider to develop the skill and then you develop in one internal champion. And that internal champion then kind of spreads that knowledge and skill set throughout the rest of the team. And that's more cost efficient than trying to train the entire team. And you can do this not just with usability testing, but really any research method. Um, some principles to follow. Next slide, please. Is to test as early and often as you can. Okay. Don't bother testing with more than five or so people. Um, studies show that about 80, 85% of usability tests will be found with a very small sample size. So this is not like attitudinal surveys where you need large sample sizes to get good understanding of trends. You're just trying to see what stands out as problems in, in the usability of your product. And you don't need a lot of people for that. If you have time for more than five people, then just do it in different rounds where you're iterating your design between each round. Right. You don't want to test the exact same thing with another group of five people. Right. Um, test it with five, make some changes, test it with another five. Right. If you have multiple personas using your product, do five for each persona. Right. So if you have a primary and a secondary, it's good to understand the differences and how those audiences will use your product. Um, and then just rinse and repeat until you get it right and you gain the confidence. OK. The biggest thing here in terms of why is the earlier you do this, the more you can impact the product direction. Um, it's less costly, it's easier to implement, and the end user experience is going to be better. Okay, so it makes everybody happier, it, it reduces rework, and it increases product and hence business success. So don't wait into the, don't fall into this trap that I see too often of waiting till you have this beautiful high fidelity prototype where everything works and it's ready to test. Okay, don't wait for readiness. Get it out there as soon as possible. People give better feedback on lower fidelity prototypes than high fidelity prototypes. Because in user testing, what we learn is that the more your UI is implemented into your prototype, the more they're going to comment on that and, instead of the UX. And that's what you really want the feedback on, right? So you can test UX with wireframes and sketches right? <laughs> and then once you get that right, then you raise the fidelity, you know, um, and get some feedback later on for that. Next slide, please. Now, the best way to prototype is in person or to test a prototype is in person with a note taker um, and a facilitator and the tester all in the same environment. This is traditional usability testing in lab settings. It's fantastic. Um, and this is really especially good for low fidelity prototypes where often you might have to explain things to people. Right. That's the downside of low fidelity is that people have to imagine what it looks like. And sometimes you need a conversation just with people. So you're saving a bunch of money by not raising the fidelity of it. But then you have to structure the testing environment where you can explain things to people. So it has to be moderated when you're doing low fidelity, or it should be, in my opinion, at least. Now, as you increase that fidelity, we can start using online tools. Um, and you can start using the unmoderated testing format. And so you can see here, I've got screenshots of Sprig and Maze, um, which are two uh, prototype, unmoderated prototype testing tools that I enjoy, and I think they're both very good. Um, but I want you to understand that they are, uh, there are limitations to moderated or unmoderated testing. And one of the biggest mistakes I see made is um, product teams get, Get, see advertisements from companies like this and they go, great, you know, this is going to save me so much time and money. And they try to do an unmoderated test in a moderated, I mean, sorry, what you need to do for a moderated test in an unmoderated environment, right? In other words, they try to do too much, right? When you're using unmoderated testing, you can really only test one flow where you're asking very specific questions and your script design has to be flawless. Um, if you don't have really, really well-designed questions and there's any room for ambiguity, people are going to make all kinds of mistakes simply because you can't clarify anything to them in an unmoderated test, right? So your test design has to be really good and it has to be very narrowly scoped to use the unmoderated tools. It's fantastic for when you're making small changes to your product and you just want to get quick feedback on that. But again, you have to know the right instrument, right instrument for the job. I've seen people lose faith, faith in tools like this because they use them inappropriately and they try to blame it on the tool. 
It's not the tool. It's just the wrong choice of the instrument. Okay, the tool's great. And it's really great for certain things. You just got to know what to use when. Okay, and so here's kind of a, a side by side. Next slide, please, of moderated and unmoderated testing. So this is good if you just need a definition of what I'm talking about. So the lesson, the, the, the moral of this story is don't take shortcuts just to save money, right? You end up getting poor quality results and abandonment of otherwise very good platforms, okay? Um, if you want to do research, talk with someone who knows what the right methodology is and then choose your tool set from that understanding. And it might be unmoderated or it might need to be moderated, which is having a discussion with people. And everybody, you know, tries to go for the cheapest, quickest one. And I get that. Um, but, you know, we're getting different types of results from different types of studies. Next slide, please. Okay. So how do we design one of these tests, right? Well, the first thing you got to do is think about what do you want to learn? What are the objectives of the study? And then how am I going to meet those objectives? So this is kind of research design 101. Once you have your objectives and you have figured out how you're going to meet them, then you have to design the components for all states of your system, right? What is every possible UX scenario that you need to test and um, make sure that the artifact that you're testing with, whether it's in a dev sandbox or whether it's a Figma prototype, can do all those things and actually has all those states. If you are going to ask users to input data, well you have to give them that data, right? So in Figma, a lot of time we have to pre-populate that data simply because users can't interact with text data in the fields. Um, but if you're using a sandbox environment where users can use their own or dummy data, you have to give them that data set. So you have to prepare these assets for them um, and prepare an explanation for people about how they're gonna use those assets. Then you gotta write a list of tasks for people to perform. And in good usability testing, we often make these visible to a user. Um, in, in the uh, lab testing environment, we actually have a printed piece of paper, which has the list of tasks on it for them to refer to. That way they don't have to remember what they're being asked to do. They can just look down at the sheet and say, okay, this is what I'm focused on. When I do remote testing, I just have like a PowerPoint that I give them, or I send them a PDF of the tasks and they can just have that on their own desk. Right. Um, or if we're in a multi-window environment, I'll have the tasks open and slides in one uh, window, and I'll have the test open in another window. So again, they have that constant reference point to what it is that you're asking them to do. You don't want them trying to think about, hmm, what data am I inputting? Or, hmm, what was I asked to do again? You want them focused on doing that thing, right? It's less cognitive load for them so they can pay more attention to the task and give you better feedback. Just like with interviews, you want to give people a brief introduction to, the, to set the stage, allow them to role play in that environment. And then finally, you want to ask people to perform the task and think out loud as they do so. So you want them to externalize their internal monologue. And often we have to prompt people and remind people to do that. Um, so those are some really basics. Next slide, please. Um, but then take a look at this. <laughs> you know, this is a usability test checklist. One of those other assets that I'm going to put in the drive for you. Oh my God, that's a lot to do. This is why it takes 30 to 40 hours to do one of these properly. Okay. You can read this at, at your own pace, but there's a lot of work. There's a lot of logistics. Recruitment takes forever. You got to get your environment right. You got to work with the design and the dev team half the time, and they've got busy schedules. So a lot of times it just takes sometimes weeks just to get the thing set up right to even run and then another week or two to recruit people. And then once you're doing it, it's actually relatively fast, right? You can do all your tests in a, in a few days and then you can do your analysis in a few days after that. But it's just the whole process involves a whole bunch of different little things to actually make it go smoothly. Now, <laughs> this is one of my favorite little videos. Let's see if it'll play. So let's just watch this. Oh, wait, you guys can't watch the video. You're looking at a PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you're looking at a PDF. Basically, what this was is uh, what usability testing looked like when we did it in paper. Okay. And you literally made your screens out of different paper and you had like a cardboard cutout of the interface and you would ask people to do things. There's the task list on the left. Right. And then as they would do things, you would moderate the screen. So you would literally physically replace one piece of paper with the next screen and you would, you know, they would touch it and press the buttons. And this is for a long time how usability testing was done. Um, and this is not, you know, like backyard garage usability testing. This is like major corporations with major products. 
fortunately, we can do all of this digitally these days, but the technique is still the same. And it really emphasizes the point that low fidelity is better for this. Okay. Um, next slide, please. And then, you know, kind of once you have gone through that process of testing low fidelity and you've raised it up, you can then um, wire it to become a model of the real thing. Or you, if you have a physical product in particular, you can do Wizard of Oz prototype testing where you have a system that people are looking at, but behind the scenes, it's a human operating the things rather than, than the actual software, right? So you are emulating the full functionality of the product. And to the person that's testing, it looks almost real, right? There's still a little bit of pretending and imagination going on, but it's as close as you can get. Um, and this gets you really, really great results because now the the gap of imagination is much smaller, but you still haven't had to figure out functionally how to make all those things work yet, right? So you can just, you can, you can Wizard of Oz it, right? Um, and here you really want to make sure that you are practicing with your own team to make sure that your Wizard of Oz prototype is working as smoothly as it possibly can. You know, practice your moderation so that you can, you know, catch your own little small verbal mistakes and fix those. Um, and then also it's important to think through what's going to happen when your users do something that you didn't expect. Does your system have the capacity to allow them to go in a different direction than what you intended? And um, if you can do that, that's great. If you can't, then you have to call it a task failure and then have a conversation around why. So I think that Wizard of Oz is a really fantastic um, intermediate form of testing when you have very tight timelines and um, you don't, you want to test before you do any more development work, right? And this is a great way to do it. Um, so you just mimic that system that you're building. Or maybe you've got your front end finished, but your back end isn't finished, right? This is another place where wizard uh, prototyping is really, really a great technique. Okay. Um, we're close to time. So I'm going to move quickly through these last few slides. Um, if we go a couple minutes over, I apologize, but I will try to cover it all. Um, you know, usability issues, right? When you take notes in a task, you're trying to understand these things, right? What prevents people from completing tasks? What slows them down, gets them off course? What forces them to find a workaround? What confuses them, irritates them? What forces errors? What prevents people from noticing something? Or what implies things are okay when they're actually not, okay? Anytime I see one of these, when I do usability testing with notes, I actually have codes for these things and I just shorthand write those codes down. Or if you're using a piece of software that has tags, you can create tags. And then as you're going through and you're rewatching that test again, you can drop those tags where you see these problems, All right? If you're gonna do a, a note taking sheet um, digitally or physically, it could be something that looks like this. My formatting is a little bit off on this slide. Next one, please. But essentially, it's a worksheet where you have your tasks laid out. You have those tasks success, right? Did they succeed? How well did they succeed? Did they struggle or did they fail? And then you have notes that you can take. And so you can do this live. If you've got you know, a moderator and a note taker, your note taker can be doing this during the test. If it's only one person running a usability test, you have to go back and you have to rewatch the video of the test. And then you take notes the second time around. Don't try to take detailed notes while you're facilitating. It's really hard to do. And either your facilitation ends up suffering or you miss things in your notes. You got to have either two people or two passes to do it well. Okay. And so when you're doing the usability test, you are focused on the conversation that you're having with that person and really doing a good job of facilitating that experience. Okay. There's another role, which is the, that keen observer. And again, it can be live with a note taker or it can be something that is a rewatch of the video. Okay, these are some tips that will help you minimize bias. Next slide, please. Um, you know, one, don't test your own designs. Ask one of your colleagues to do it because when you test your own designs, you are going to be biased. There's no way around it. Okay, so just exchange favors with people. You need someone who's not going to defend the product. That's the worst mistake. Someone makes a mistake and you correct them or someone says something critical and you explain why it's there. Don't ever do that in a usability test because they're not, you're not gonna be able to do that when they're using the product in the real world, <laughs> you know? Um, but it's really good for you still to be there if it's your product. You're just the silent observer. Maybe you're the note taker, right? So that you're watching what's happening and in a chat, 
you can sit there and you can chat to the moderator. And if there's any questions or things that come up that you want them to ask, you can tell them, hey, ask these things, right? So it's really great to be there, but just not to be the one moderating, okay? Make sure you're testing people who haven't been part of the project. They're biased if they already know your product, okay? You want to reach out to representative users and use your marketing team, use your sales, your support team, use third-party recruitment apps. Do whatever it takes to get a representative sample of real life users of the product. Okay. Don't rely on AI. You know, AI is great for speeding things up, but you still have to audit and double check everything it does. So it's great to help, but you still have to go back through and interpret things yourself. Um, and then when you're doing a usability test with five people, do not iterate the design between those people because then all of your data is bad. You can't do side-by-side -side comparison. You need to do one round of testing with the product exactly the way it is. So if you see some glaring error in the first test, don't fix it and then do four more. Just keep it because you're going to see that error in all five, and that's a very strong metric that you can then report out. Okay. And then, of course, capture the insights right after each test or after each round of testing. Get together as a team and ask, what did we learn? Okay. And then finally, reporting, right? So this slide is, you know, how do, how do you tell people that their baby is ugly? Um, start off with the positives, right? Always begin with what's successful in the design. If you start off and you'd be like, well, five out of five users thought that you didn't even put the button in the right place. The rest of that conversation is not going to go well for you or them. But if you start off and you say, hey, all your word work, all your hard work has succeeded and here's where. People love this experience. These are the moments of delight then you psychologically prime your audience to be in a more positive state, which means they can receive criticism more openly instead of just shutting you down, okay? Second, don't just say something, back it up with data, right? Never, ever, ever say something critical from a usability report without really good evidence. Also, don't say something positive without evidence. If one person likes your product and the rest of them were like, meh, that's not a positive highlight. So again, just do it right. You know, I think it's important to describe the impact and severity of the problems. And this is where those rating scales and user success matter. Like, how bad was the problem? Like, is it something that we can get away with and fix later? Or is it something that, you know, it's causing a lot of critical errors. We need to fix this now. Um, and then support that with actual videos, like highlight reels that show people struggling or show people succeeding, right? Um, and the idea here is that when the team eventually argues, which we all do, um, that we're arguing around real data, right? Instead of what you think your customers want or what you think leadership wants or what you as the designer think is the best thing. That's all great, but that's just ideas. Data is what tells us what to do. Um, and then, you know, in your reports, re make recommendations on how to fix things or what to do next or where to put it in the timeline. That's a good report. So this is another quote. Next slide, please, that I really uh, admire. And I think it's a, a great attitude, which is what's the smallest, simplest change that we can make when we, when we go through this process um, to help keep people from having the problem that we observed. Don't try to boil the ocean. Try to figure out what's the smallest thing that you can do. You can make more substantial improvements over time, but usually you're just trying to make a small improvement so that your, your product succeeds. Right. And then you can put it on the roadmap to make more fundamental changes later. So parting tips for today. One, leverage your trifecta. I told you at the beginning, I do believe in the trifecta model from Marty Kagan. I think it's great to have everybody involved, but make sure that you have the voice of research involved. So maybe it's not just a trifecta. You know, I don't know what the word for four is, but, you know, there are four major endpoints that inputs that are needed for great design and product success. If you got a researcher, listen to them. And always start with the assumption that your baby is ugly. Any 20-headed Hydra is. In other words, if you've got a product with a bunch of features, part of it's ugly. Part of it's beautiful. Figure out which part and run with that. Now, the challenge I'll leave you with today is to actually try to execute what I've taught you, right? Build a usability test. Run it, okay? And then reflect upon the process and see what you know, what you don't know, where you can improve and where you need help. And that's when you reach out to us if you need it. Here's how to get in touch. So that's all I have for today. Um, Akosh, if you want to wrap it up. Absolutely. Let's get the um, cameras uh, right. So, Brian, uh, 
thanks so much. Uh, it was so insightful. I'm, I'm so happy we recorded everything because I need to go back to the recording uh, to, to re-listen to, to some, uh, some of the parts. I'd like to thank the audience and everyone uh, for, for the question, for the activity and for the, for the humor uh, and, the, and the energy levels. And Brian, to you as well for like uh, delighting us uh, in these hours with all the wisdom and packaging and wrapping it in entertaining stories. I'm really grateful for you to, to be here for us and uh, the sessions. All right. Thanks for having me.